He was a fighter who always seemed to fly under the radar. Battling his way to the top of the cruiserweight division, he enjoyed a two-year championship reign defending his title with come-from-behind victories. Yet despite providing fans with exciting fights, local reporters chose to shine the spotlight on other fighters who had larger fan bases, but nowhere near his accomplishments. So he remained in obscurity, a fighter without the recognition he deserved in his own community, a city whose newspapers never headlined the name of the world champion they had in. Leroy Murphy grew up in poverty as the sixth child among 12 siblings residing in the public housing projects of Chicago. His father was a mailman, but after he left, the family had to take refuge in a Salvation Army shelter for a few weeks before settling into a 12th floor apartment in the infamous Robert Taylor housing projects. Prior to that, they had lived in various homes which they were forced to vacate due to unsanitary conditions or fires. Murphy's mother Katie had to raise the children single-handedly and worked as a cleaner for a railroad company. It's like I'm in prison, Katie said. You go out there and you get shot. The elevators hardly work and I can't walk 12 floors. And if they do, you don't want to get in one alone. There are two conflicting accounts regarding Leroy Murphy's entry into the world of boxing. One version states that as a 14-year-old paperboy, he visited the home of a 17-year-old acquaintance who happened to be an amateur boxer. The boy playfully punched Murphy, who instinctively retaliated and knocked him out. The second account claims that after losing a fight to a rival paperboy, a concerned friend brought Murphy to a boxing gym so he could learn how to fight. In any case, Murphy discovered that he had a greater affinity for boxing than for track or football while attending Phillips High School. Football is a lot rougher than boxing, Murphy said. After graduating, Murphy contemplated joining the military but ultimately viewed boxing as his ticket to escape the high crime neighborhood. I wanted to get my family out of there, Murphy said. I wanted to get my mother out of the projects. Murphy proceeded to win 157 out of 174 amateur bouts. He won the National Golden Gloves in spectacular fashion, getting knocked down by Alvino Manson in the first round before stopping him moments later. He made the 1980 Olympic team and was appointed captain of the squad. Unfortunately, the U.S. boycotted the Moscow Games, and Murphy was robbed of both exposure and an opportunity for a gold medal. Nonetheless, he participated in the alternate Olympics held in Kenya and emerged as one of five American boxers to win gold medals, competing against the 25 other countries that had also honored the boycott. Murphy worked two jobs, one as a playground supervisor at a nearby housing project and another as a guard for the Cook County Sheriff's Department. But after his amateur boxing success, promoter Bob Arum offered Murphy a $15,000 bonus and TV exposure on ESPN, but the deal fell through. Murphy turned professional under manager and trainer Jim Strickland, a former boxer out of Kansas who also worked as a pharmacist. But without a big-name promoter backing him, his progress was slow. Strickland wanted Murphy to get down to 175 pounds to compete at light heavyweight, but Murphy simply didn't train hard and ate himself into the cruiserweight division. He acquired the nickname of Solid Gold, but three years into his pro career, the biggest name on his resume was a first-round knockout of Ralph Cuomo, the nephew of New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Murphy's lackadaisical attitude caught more experienced fighters in the Chicago area, like Johnny Lira, by surprise. Lira chastised Murphy when he saw him eating a hot dog shortly before entering the ring. It's no problem, Murphy said. I'll knock him out. True to his word, Murphy scored a KO. Neither of us is hungry, his trainer Strickland said. Neither of us has experience in the pros. Both of us have a great deal of principle. Maybe if Leroy didn't have a job or if he didn't like it so well, he'd be more enthused about wanting to fight and not be as patient as he is. 
Despite enduring chronic ear infections, Murphy remained undefeated leading up to his title challenge against IBF champion Marvin Camel in October of 1984. Murphy traveled to Camel's home turf in Montana and faced a hostile crowd as well as a proud champion. Despite a slow start, Murphy managed to knock Camel down and ultimately stopped him in the 14th round due to cuts. Camel's fans protested, hurling objects into the ring which prompted Murphy's team to require a police escort to leave the arena safely. Murphy then made his first title defense against young Joe Lewis two months later in a battle of crosstown rivals in Chicago. Leroy Murphy is swollen. It's perfect. He is going to have some shine tomorrow. They both are. And both guys are content to stand right on top of one another and bang away now. As you said, young Joe is not dancing. Oh, he took the right hand. Oh, he walked into it. This is where Murphy, I believe this is where Murphy, cut. yeah. Yes. But Murphy took a hook, and Joe's hollering again with that little yell of his, and he's coming alive. The challenger whooping it up. The crowd, many of them on their feet now. This one could end with one shot from either guy. They're both tired. They're and Murphy is leaning on the ropes right now, Randy. And that is what we haven't seen all night with Murphy with his back on the rope. These guys are now being called. They have to suck it up, reach down and pull it out. Oh, the right uppercut by Murphy got in, and it hurt young Joe Lewis. And Murphy walked into a right hand from young Joe, but Joe was backing up. Oh, there's a left right combination to the head of young Joe for Murphy. And another right. And Murphy and young Joe holds on again. There's still power. There's plenty of power on the part of the and champion. Young Joe doing everything he can to stay in close. He smothered the punches to take the power away. He comes right back. Oh, and a right uppercut that was so wild and amateurish on the part of the champion, but Young Joe Lewis too tired to take advantage of it with a counter left hook. And this one... Almost history. Right side of his, the left side of his head with a right hand. Well, there's no quit in either guy right here, Randy. Oh, my goodness, no. Look at the shots both are taking. I think it's a fight plan now with young Joe Lewis to stay right on top of Leroy Murphy, either right on top of him or about 200 yards away. Yes. Doesn't want to. Ooh, a right hand. And he stopped Young Joe in his track. Young Joe is about to go. He's all over him right now. Randy. I hope he's on. He's putting him away. Oh. That's oh. it for Young Joe. Oh, he was, that's it. We knew it would be a matter of time, Randy, before Leroy Murphy would key off with that right hand. And he worked a long time. It was not easy for him here in the Bismarck Hotel right here in Chicago. The champion proved that he is the champ, Randy. He certainly did because he was tired, he was battered, and he was getting hit and hit and hit. But as we've been pointing out, he's got explosive power. The unofficial time, 137 of the 12th round. Let's go to the ring announcer now, Ben Bentley. Following his defense against Lewis, NBC expressed interest in having Murphy face off against former light heavyweight champion Dwight Muhammad Kwawi. However, Murphy suffered a hand injury that prevented him from being ready for the bout. In addition, he gained weight due to his tendency of not training unless he had a fight scheduled. He doesn't work like an athlete should, trainer Carmen Graziano said. He's lazy. But if anyone could ever motivate him, the heavyweights would have to watch out. People only assume whether I'm in shape or not, Murphy offered in rebuttal. They don't know and it hasn't hurt my record. Murphy was disappointed by the lack of recognition he received for his achievements and the fact that he did not have a significant fan base in his hometown of Chicago. Instead, local reporters focused on covering contenders like Craig Bozianowski and John Collins, rather than on a world champion like Murphy. After his victory against Lewis, Murphy took a 10-month break from the ring before returning to fight against Jacinda Muti from Zambia. Murphy started slow as usual. I guess I was more afraid of Muti than he was of me, Murphy said. Sure, I feel afraid when I'm getting ready to box. 
A lot can happen to you. You can get hurt, go into a coma. I worry about a lot before a fight and against Moody, I wasn't mentally or physically prepared. And sometimes I get that way. Murphy found himself unable to avoid Moody's relentless punches, feeling dejected as he slumped on a stool after the seventh round. He confided in trainer Strickland that he was ready to give up. But Strickland refused to let him give in, delivering a passionate pep talk to remind Murphy of all he had accomplished and all that still lay ahead. It was a pivotal moment as Murphy faced a decision, retreat to a life of staring out of his 12th floor window in the projects, wondering what could have been, or he could dig deep and rise to the occasion. The fight itself and the double knockdown drew comparisons to the Rocky movies. But despite the Hollywood-style finish, Murphy's earnings were meager, getting paid only $50,000 before half was taken away for expenses. There was no welcoming parade waiting for him back in Chicago, no outpouring of adulation. Instead, he arrived at O'Hare Airport carrying his own bag and walking through the terminal unnoticed. The fight had not been broadcast nationally, and the limited exposure left Murphy as the same unknown fighter he was before. 
He rested six months before traveling to Italy to defend against the six foot five inch Dorsey Gaiman. As I said, this isn't a big payday for Leroy, but he's looking for bigger ones in, in the future. Well, the cruiserweight division has become somewhat of a, a jumping off grounds to get into the heavyweight division. A lot of them would just want to get a world title so they have some bargaining position as Gammon shown some good punching power. Really not known as a puncher per se, more of a jabber and runner. And he's laying some good leather on the uh, champion right now. Oh, some of those right arms, uh, you know, they start five feet away and come in at you. He's got such long arms. Some excellent action here in the first, uh, first two minutes. Gammon is heavily in the distance works. He runs a lot like six, eight miles a day, so uh, they feel he can go the distance. It just comes down to if he can take a punch from Leroy Murphy. And we're midway through the first round here. San Remo, Italy, the IBF cruiserweight title. 15 rounds between the champion, Leroy Murphy, making his third title defense, and the challenger, Dorsey Gaiman. And it's an even fight up to this point. I, I score one round apiece, and uh, Gammon has been far more impressive than I think a lot of people thought he would be. And Murphy doesn't look as, uh, as sharp as you think he would be. He's only his third title defense, and really, Gammon has really kept him in the corners, Don. Well, Murphy's had a hard time getting out of the corners. He has spent a good portion of the fight on the ropes, leaning on the ropes in the corners. And you'd imagine a, a smaller, compact fighter like Murphy would be wise to follow a Joe Frazier type of style, and that's always bobbing and weaving and being the aggressor and moving inside on your opponent, but so far he's he's been the counter puncher, the guy staying away. Mm -hmm. Look at Gaiman, just how aggressive he is. He's, he's had Murphy on the ropes or in the corner this entire mm -hmm. round so far, and it's a minute old. Gaiman has certainly gotten uh, the champion's attention because uh, right now I think Murphy is just kind of shaking his head and uh, trying to sort things out because the reach is looking good, the jab looks good, and uh, the power, which I didn't think he had too much of, is really, uh, really showing. Well, this won't go, won't go down as one of the prettier fights uh, we've seen as far as these two guys. But they've exchanged a lot of leather. It's not been a bad fight. Good left. And a right. And there's some blood around the mouth of Dorsey Gaiman for the first time in this fight, and the action picks up. It's almost like Murphy saw it and he uh, got hungry all of a sudden. Closing seconds of round number eight, and some blood from the mouth of Gaiman. <laughs> Oh, look at Gaiman. He is <laughs> now the legs are weak. Ex excellent left by Murphy. Now he smells it. Could be finishing him off. That's going to be it. Woo! That's uh, that's quick and painless there, yeah. Todd. At 2:30 of the ninth round, he goes down and he won't get up. There's no question about this one. He will not get up. And retaining his IBF cruiserweight title, Leroy Murphy with a ninth round knockout of George Gaiman. It came fast, you. Well, Despite his impressive knockout record, the lack of recognition given to Murphy seemed to leave him dejected and unmotivated. Promoter Cedric Kushner suggested that Murphy leave Chicago to train for his next defense against Ricky Parkey, but Murphy refused. He was determined to help the neighborhood kids in their upcoming swimming program and wanted to stay in his hometown. Unfortunately, Murphy gained over 30 pounds over the next six months and was five pounds over the cruiserweight limit on the day before the fight. This forced him to spend hours in the sauna the night before the bout. Entering the ring weight drained, Murphy lost his title in a one-sided defeat. Ten months later, Murphy stepped into the ring for his biggest showcase yet, a fight against Dwight Muhammad Kwawi to be broadcast on Showtime. But something had changed in Murphy. The fire that once drove him to come from behind victories appeared to have burned out. If, if it, I, at night I'd sit down and I wonder about the way I'm going to fight them and the type of attitude I'm going to have going in ring. It sort of, it, it bothers me because I never fought a, a fighter who used to be a world champion and, you know, and plus the age difference. It's just 
the experience, and then I don't think he had more experience than I do because I've been around longer. So it's just, he's just another punch to me. But, but he is a bit of a nightmare, though. Truly he is. And no mystery about what he's going to do. No way. <laughs> it's like riding piggyback on a buzzsaw, and you know that you got to get him off you. That's right. So how do you do it? Well, there's several ways. Either I fight him like a cause, he'll fight him, or I go to move and hit him run and stay away from his left hook and right hooks. And what do you? How do you punch him? Well, he's, op he's open. He give you the head. So if I get my two or three shots and get out of there, you know I'll be safe for at least five or six rounds. You know my the object of it to try to attack Hawaii out in the, in the earlier rounds. If I get him tied out the earlier round, I swear I can have more control of the fight going into the later rounds. I don't want to be an amateur psychologist with you, but all during this interview, I look at you and I hear you saying to me, this is my make or break fight. This is it, everything. It determines whether I go on and fight or whether I go back to Chicago and take care of my family and work as a sheriff. Is that what you're saying? Well, in a way it is because, you know, like I say, boxing takes a lot. It takes a lot of sacrifice and even in your job and your home life. And I feel that if I don't make it, if I don't make it this last chance, you know, I might as well give it a lot of thought after the fight. If I lose, to think about, see, do I really want to continue this or do I want to put another year in this or not? And as you pointed out, Ferdy, the pre-fight talk by Murphy, as exposed in that interview with Dave Niles, sounded defeatist in tone. It sounded like a loser. It sounded like a guy's ready to lose and go home and be a sheriff. This uh, is which a guy is unusual for this man who has had most of his career going his way, knockouts all over the place. 25 wins. One loss, the only loss, a 10-round knockout by Ricky Parkey in October of 1986. Parkey later lost that IBF cruiserweight crown. Just, Dawi just landed a very hard hammering right hand, which staggered Leroy Murphy. And in the first round, this looks like the kind of fight that Dwight Muhammad Dawi would like for it to be. Murphy standing in front of him, more or less a stationary target for Dawi, who is the least subtle cruiserweight fighters in his approach. Now, as the first round comes toward a close, Cowie landing all of the effective punches so far in the first round. Another right hand. He couldn't have this round more his way. He's, he's planned the fight and he's carrying it out. Every little strategy has worked. And what I see in Leroy Murphy is what I saw in the lobby. A great deal of lethargy and disinterest. He just doesn't seem to be in it this first round. And Kawi has dominated this first round. Leroy Murphy has been housed at the same hotel which we occupied. We'll go back now to his corner between rounds one and two where manager and trainer Jim Strickland will step in directly in front of Leroy Murphy and try to make an impact on the fighter who was lethargic to say the least in the first stand. Not only is he lethargic, but just interested. He just, his mind doesn't seem to be here. It doesn't seem to be for the last three or four days. I've been talking to him in the lobby for three or four days. He has not moved from the same chair for three or four days. And I just found it very unusual. He has no mental uh, stamina. He has no mental strength. He's not looking forward to this. He was just sort of saying, well, when the day comes, I'll fight it. We'll see. And certainly fought the first round that way. And certainly lost the first round that way. I gave it 10-9 to Kawi. You know, the history of bangers, that, that uh, you go on a long spree of knockouts like Leroy Murphy's had, and then all of a sudden you lose one by knockout. And then you're never the same fighter again and have to Sonny Liston have many of the big bangers who are used to having everything go their way. I don't know what happened to Leroy Murphy as far as his stamina and as far as his intention is concerned. He has certainly has put himself in harm's way when he stands directly in front of Kawi and lets Kawi come in hooking as he just did then and missed. Uh, the whole first round was, couldn't be better for Kawi. And of course, Evander Holyfield's got a whole bunch of that, and so has Dwight Kawi. Right now, 
the problem is for Leroy Murphy to get a little bit of it so that he can begin to make a battle of this rather than just get a pummeling, which he has been doing relentlessly through four rounds. We're in round five of a scheduled 10 in San Tropez. Leroy Murphy so far taking a beating from Dwight Muhammad Kawi. Kawi intent on getting another shot at a cruiserweight title and perhaps a rematch with the man who took that crown away from him last summer, Vander Holyfield. Murphy goes down to one knee after a series of Kawi punches. That, that's more a uh, give up than a, than a knockdown. That's more a listen. I'm not going to take too much of this. That was a perfectly timed right counter to Leroy Murphy's right. Leroy threw a hard right. Howie threw a perfectly timed punch. And then two or three punches later, and it was more of a delayed effect. Well, the opportunity is certainly there now for Kawi if he can put a few punches together. Round five comes to a close. Jim, the interview before the fight becomes meaningful. Here's an interview that with Dave Dowd, that uh, Leroy Murphy sounded listless and uninspired and almost considering alternatives to boxing, saying, well, I can go back and be a sheriff. I can do this. I can do that. He didn't hear any of that, uh, listen, I'm going to take this guy's head off and I'm going to go fight for the title. And it's exactly what's happened in the ring. That is exactly. He is just here. His body is here. There's no intention, and all he's done is take a good beat. Tremendous punch from and Dice again, Murphy again. puts one knee on the canvas. French referee Rene Barre issuing the count. Mandatory eight count in effect. Kawi comes back in, a right hand, another right hand. Competitively, it appears to be over at this point. Murphy offering very little in return. Again, Murphy goes down. Barre will count one more time. The three knockdown rule is in effect. Plenty of time still to go in round six. Now we brandishing a fist at Murphy as the count continues. Barre decides that's enough. Murphy remained out of the ring for almost two years before making his comeback as a heavyweight against his old crosstown rival, Alfonso Ratliff. Murphy's power was still evident, stopping Ratliff in just four rounds. However, he didn't fight consistently over the next two years and struggled to keep his weight in check, ballooning up to as much as 242 pounds. In 1991, Murphy decided to hang up the gloves, but he couldn't resist the itch to lace them up again. Seven years later, he stepped back into the ring for two more fights before finally retiring for good. After boxing, Murphy found a new career as a sheriff in Cook County, Illinois, before retiring from the Chicago Transit Authority. Despite not setting out to become a fighter, Murphy did become a world champion and now enjoys his retirement years as a family man, spending time with his wife, daughter, and grandchildren.